Hello, everybody, and welcome to this research seminar organized by BCLT, the British Center for Literary Translation. My name is Duncan Large, and I'm the BCLT's academic director. Today's seminar is our first in 2021 and the first in our new semester at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, England, where BCLT is based. BCLT research seminars are all free to access this year in the first instance via Zoom webinar and from shortly after the event via the BCLT's channel on YouTube, where you'll also find recordings of earlier seminars, sem sessions from our annual summer school and so on. If this is the first time that you've joined us, then you might like to subscribe on Eventbrite so that you'll be notified of as soon as details of other events are posted. I'm pleased to say that today's seminar has proved particularly popular and sold out earlier today, even though we'd made more tickets available than usual. Today's speaker is Olivia Hellowell who is a translator from Slovene to English of literary fiction, children's fiction, and nonfiction in the field of arts and culture. Born in Sheffield, Olivia studied Spanish and Russian as an undergraduate at Nottingham University, followed by an AHRC funded postgraduate diploma in Slovene. After living in Slovenia for a while, Olivia returned to Nottingham for an MA and then an ESRC funded PhD in Translation Studies. Since 2020, Olivia has been an ESRC postdoctoral fellow, research fellow in Translation Studies at Nottingham. Olivia's first novel translation, Jela Krecic's None Like Her, was published by Istros Books and Peter Owen Publishers in 2016 and long listed for the Dublin Impact Prize that year. In 2019, her translation of an excerpt from Katja Perat's novel, The Masochist, was, first, was awarded first prize in Asymptote Journal's Close Approximations Translation Contest. Last year, Olivia published two new translations. Firstly, Dunya Yogan's children's book, Felix After the Rain, from Tiny Owl Books, which won an English Pen Award and was chosen by the UK's Centre for Literacy in Primary Education as one of their best books of 2020. And then Goran Boinovich's The Fig Tree from Istros Books, which we launched at BCLT in early November and which was selected by World Literature Today as one of its 75 notable translations of 2020. Olivia's connection to BCLT has been a very strong one in recent years, I'm glad to say. At our summer school in 2019, Olivia led the Slovene English Literary Translation Workshop. Then just last semester, she was together with William Gregory, one of our two inaugural BCLT translators in residence. During their period in residence, in virtual residence, Olivia and William wrote a number of fascinating blog posts with BCLT's Ceci Rossi that you can read on newwriting.net. And no sooner has Olivia vacated the res residency than we invite her back again. She will also be back with us this summer, leading the multilingual prose workshop for less translated languages at Summer School 2021, which has just opened for applications on our website, bclt.org.uk. Now, today's talk relates to Olivia's current work at Nottingham, where she's developing her doctoral research project into supply driven translation, less translated languages, and power and agency in literary translation more generally. In April this year, she's organizing a digital symposium on these themes at Nottingham entitled Supplying Translation. Now, at the end of Olivia's talk today, we'll have a question session. So do please use the Q&A function to submit any questions that you would like to be considered. And I'll put them to Olivia on your behalf. But for now, though, it's my great pleasure to hand over to Olivia Hellowell. Her title today is Supply Driven Translation and Less Translated Languages. Olivia. Thank you, everybody, for coming and for tuning in. I know there's a lot of competition for uh, our attention these days, so I very much appreciate you being here 
with me and I'm and it's a particular privilege I think to have the opportunity to share one's research in a wider forum like this um particularly because having been so focused on one um particular small nation context during my um, PhD research one of the things that's really helping to energize me at the moment are conversations with other translators this happened particularly during my residency at the BCLT, which was a great opportunity to have those kind of conversations. Um, but when those translators note patterns and overlaps with the way that literary translation often happens between their respective language combinations and the processes that I've observed in the Slovene context, that's what I find really exciting. And that's what's kind of driving me to see where this might lead. So you'll see that on my slide, I've bracketed the less translated languages element to signal that in actual fact that today what I'm talking about is just one less translated language, Slovene. But the nod to less translated languages in general is there as an invitation really, because whilst I'm going to be talking about the ways in which Slovene literature can come to exist in English translation, I've proposed three principal ways in which these ha this happens, and I wonder whether or not these might be recognisable to others. Of course, there are very specific uh, conditions, historic, geographic. There are discourses that shape the hows and the whys of producing uh, literary translations from Slovene. But that drive to supply and that urge, that need to be seen in translation in some senses, is not uniquely Slovene. And for me, the idea um, of looking at translation as a supply driven process is an invitation to see what and who we miss when we assume that um, literary translations in English exist solely because the market demanded them. So speaking of demand, what I would like to put to you today is that one of the most prevalent assumptions within what we might broadly and perhaps clumsily term the Anglophone publishing sphere is that, literary li that literature published in English translation was translated and published as a result of some form of demand, which as you can see is very um, articulately demonstrated by those arrows coming inwards. Um, and so I'd like you to just think about that for a second. If someone were to ask you why a particular book had been translated, what would you say? Maybe the author had been a bestseller in the source language, or maybe a publisher had seen a book at a fair, Maybe the book tied in with a particular trend in the Anglophone publishing world and filled a perceived gap. These are all plausible explanations. For many literary translations, these will be accurate descriptions of their roots publication. But what happens when there is no demand from the target publishing market? What if there are no international bestsellers? What if nobody's out scouting for fresh talent from a given national literature? What if we were to look at trans literary translations as happening like this, rather than like this? Um, and in case anybody was wondering, that is a very basic map of Slovenia. Of course, those who are engaged in literary translation from languages that aren't as typically well represented um, in the Anglophone publishing sphere are aware of a much more complicated reality. The assumption that literary translations are a result of some form of demand, I would argue, is certainly an Anglo-centric one. And I'd be interested in others' thoughts on this, but I've been wondering whether the fact that proportionately so few of the books, of the, of the kind of literary novels published in the UK and US are translations, whether that facilitates an assumption that, that the few that made it through, as it were, did so because of very concrete demands from the target publishing context. And this assumption about the way that literary translations are initiated was also something that I encountered early on with my interactions with translation theory. I was interested in systems theory because it offered a means of talking about the way in which literature, literature circulates. One theory, Itamar Evan Zohar's polysystems hypothesis, had a particular appeal. But given my translation experience working from Slovene to English, I was always struck by the language of this theory, which I would argue frames the target culture as the proactive agent in the acquisition of translations and positions translations as a commodity to be imported 
rather than export it. So for example, if we note the phrasing here, Evan Zohar argues that translated literature correlates with the target national literature in two ways. The first being in the way their source texts are selected by the target literature. Now, there's lots of things to say about polysystems and I haven't gone into detail about that here, but I place the emphasis there in this quotation because that's what I see is important here. His argument is based on an assumption that a target culture does the selecting and the source culture, which invests time, capital and labor in driving a supply of translations. Um, sorry. And what, what I went on to find in my research into Slovene literary translations is that this assumption that the selecting is all done on the part of the target culture actually obscures the actions of many individuals and organizations in the source culture who invest their time, their capital and their labor in driving a supply of translations and for a multitude of reasons. So I argue that the tendency to think of translation as a demand driven process instructs the source culture as a passive entity when in fact the picture is much more complex and interesting. But because my talk today is focusing on the Slovene context, I'll start with some very basic information to help situate everyone and contextualize this discussion. So it's a rather beige map showing where Slovenia is situated. And I assume that most people listening will, will have an idea of this, but you would be surprised at the amount of times when people think that I translate Slovakian. It still happens quite a lot. So as you can see, Slovenia is situated, nestled in between Italy, Croatia, Austria, and Hungary. There's a population of around 2 million people. And Slovenia has existed as an independent nation state since 1991, when it declared independence from Yugoslavia. Slovenes had existed within at least three larger political frameworks during the last century alone, as part of the Habsburg monarchy until its final demise in 1918, as part of the state of Slovenes, Croats and Serbs, which later became the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes, then later the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, and then as a socialist republic within the Socialist Federal, Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. So the year 1991 was therefore um, the beginning of a new order of things in Slovenia. Not only did the country uh, possess newfound political independence, but it also faced the task of transitioning from socialism to a free market economy and had to negotiate the structural changes that this entailed. I say this not just to offer an extremely brief overview of Slovene history, but also to highlight that my PhD, which analyzed the novels translated from Slovene into English between 1991 and 2016, so that 25 year period after independence, focused on a very specific moment in history and more importantly, on a changed and changing publishing environment. So my PhD research was, broadly speaking, an analysis of literature translated from Slovene into English during Slovenia's post-independence period. It looked at how so-called <coughs> small nations like Slovenia have to be proactive in funding and promoting their literature in order to circumnavigate publishing structures that tend to favor so-called major languages. As well as being interested in the cultural institutions that assumed responsibility for this task, I was also interested in how the novels translated during this time were presented to an Anglophone audience. Did they, for example, construct a certain image of Slovenia at a given time? Which genres were well represented within that corpus? What impression would a reader have of Slovene literature based on the selection available to them in English translation? Those are some of the questions that my research tackled. One of the key things that came out of this research was a framework which could be used to discuss and analyze three principal pathways that I found facilitated translations of Slovene literature into English. At a similar time, a Czech scholar of translation studies, Andrzej Vimir, had also been working on a similar topic. At a conference in Bristol in 2015, he used the term supply-driven translation, and I found it perfectly complemented what I'd begun to observe during what was then the early stages of my PhD. So Vimer posits supply-driven translation in opposition to demand-driven translation. 
And, he, and in his definition, he makes this important point. Although borrowed from economics, the terms of supply and demand applied to literary flows do not reduce literary circulation to a matter of buy, buying and selling. The dynamics of supply and demand in literary flows inherent in literary circulation expose the importance of translations for both source and target countries, cultures, institutions, and individuals. Which I understand is meaning that it, we're not just talking about the transaction itself, what, what a supply-driven approach can tell us and show us is everything that those trans transactions are bound up in and shaped by. And that's what I find really interesting. And so what my talk is focusing on today is how agents navigate the dynamics of supply and demand. And as I said, I identified three main ways in which I think this happens, three types of supply-driven translation. They're not rigid categories. Sometimes you can see elements of multiple types in one single translation journey. I'm gonna talk about these three types of supply using the examples of three translation journeys. And I'm, I'm interested to know, I wonder if anybody here might recognize these pathways from their own translation experiences, perhaps. So, three books I'm gonna talk about and three types of supply-driven translation. How did I get to the three categories in the first place? So, for my doctoral research, I constructed a corpus of novels. And the way in which I was able to do this also also reveals something about the significance attributed to Slovene literature in Slovenia and its dissemination in translation. The National University Library, or NUC as it is known, holds a copy of every literary translation from Slovene into English in a collection known as Patriotica. This is particularly helpful um, as my research was spanning two target publishing contexts, the US and the UK. So everything was housed in one place in Nuuk, and I could use the library database to apply certain criteria. Namely, I wanted to look at books that had been published in physical form in the US or the UK between the years 1991 and 2016, translated from Slovene into English, and which had been categorized by the library as novels. Um, if anybody's interested to hear more about why I chose to focus on novels, then maybe we can talk about that a bit in the questions, but um, I'll kind of, I'll try and move forward here. After I'd applied those filters, I was left with 35 results. So that was 35 publications, but 32 individual titles. There were three reprints. From the corpus of novels, I selected three that were evenly distributed by publication date one from right at the start, one from the middle, and one from the end of the time period I was looking at. The three pathways were formulated as, as a result of researching each of these books' respective journeys into English. Actually, if you look at the chapter that was later published by um, Angers in 2020, he also proposes two of these channels. This is, of course, reassuring that somebody else has seen the similar patterns. Um, but I also argue that according to the picture um, of translations from Slovene into English, the academic form of supply-driven translation has to be acknowledged too. What I decided for this presentation is that I would keep the book titles and the names of the individuals involved in this research um, anonymous. Whilst participants obviously consented, to the research at the time. I'm not sure the envisaged being quoted and cited on YouTube. So I'm going to keep that hidden. But if there's anything that you're curious about, I can do my best to elaborate in the questions or you can email me. I'm hoping that you'll still get a clear enough picture of these three pathways without every single little detail. The first book I'm going to share with you illustrates what I mean by institutional supply-driven translation, which I define as describing a process whereby cultural institutions in the source culture instigate the process of translation, typically through applying for and supplying funding to have the works of literature translated in partnership with an institution or an agent in the target culture. This type of dynamic can also sometimes be referred to as a bilateral publishing partnership. 
but I should say that's not the only that's not the only way that I see institutional forms of supply. There is a whole network of institutions that work to drive the supply of translations in Slovenia, for example, not just between publishers. Um, so in Slovenia, examples of institutions could be publishing houses, which apply for funding to finance the translations of books on their own lists, which are then published in agreement with a partner publisher in a target culture. As I've said, there are also lots of other, lots of other institutions that make up this network. Um, in the case of book number one, we are talking about a publishing partnership. It was a more recent publication. This is from the more contemporary end of the corpus. And the selection of the text was performed by the Slovene Publishing House. So they chose uh, which book to put forward for translation. They coordinated and submitted the funding application to the European Union's Creative Europe program um, and applied for the funding to pay for the translation of the book. So how might a dynamic like this impact each other's years? In this instance, where the institution driving the supply of translations is a publisher, their domestic catalogue is going to be a key influence um, on the works that are put forward. They're not going to put forward another publisher's books, for example. It's representing their own interests. That means that in the event of a, a bilateral partnership becoming successful, by which I mean, in this context, producing what we might call like a regular supply of Slovene literature in translation, then what becomes available in English is not necessarily representative of the breadth of literature being published in the source culture at that time. It's reflective of that particular publisher's list. Now, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's completely understandable why publishers do this, and it's their response to a perceived hurdle, a perceived problem. In fact, I would say that if there is a problem at all with this, the tension arises in the way that books are marketed in English, like particularly if we think about when books are marketed as being part of a national series. And there's quite a few examples where it's kind of like a national literature series. And it's that that suggests that the book is somehow representative of a, a national literature, whatever that might mean. But it's interesting to know that books arrive in different ways um, and that might not necessarily mean that they're representative if the book could ever be that. So I remember in one research interview, not with any agents from this particular institution, I should add, someone remarked, I'm paraphrasing here, um, well, if we don't take care of translating Slovene literature, nobody else will. So I see initiatives in the Slovene context, like those bilateral publishing partnerships, very much as practical responses to issues and challenges that those institutions and agents perceive. But it does also have implications for the selection of literature that becomes available. For example, if you were to look at Slovene novels available in English translation, many of these works are by contemporary living authors. And there are some books that you might assume, given their status as you know, classics in the source culture, you'd think that they'd surely been translated. But if institutions are funding translations to further the profile of their living authors, then perhaps it's not so surprising that some authors no longer with us have been left behind by these relatively contemporary publishing partnerships. And something else that we might think about in, in the case of institutional supply-driven translation, this selection of text to be translated into English may not be based on a text perceived suitability for an anglophone audience alone because with a less translated language such as Slovene there are fewer translators available particularly between other less translated languages as well with the exception of regional neighbours of course um, so the anglophone target market might not always be a primary consideration when selections are made a source culture institution could be looking beyond and the English translation could serve as a useful bridge to other markets. In the case of book one, uh, the choice of translator was also determined by the source culture organization. And this has a lot to do with 
the time frame required like when, when bids are submitted to Creative Europe. The details have to be in place before funding is guaranteed. Um, and so in an instance like this, we kind of, it reveals like quite a greater degree of agency on behalf of the source culture. Not only is that source culture institution selecting a novel to be published in English translation, it is then making the choice of translator and it's then negotiating the contract. This is all happening in the source culture. The translator here, this book, confirmed that they were approached and were asked if they were willing to undertake the project once the funding had been acquired. And the, the author of this book, their own reflections also corroborate this. And they described the selection of their novel as a case of good luck. They were contacted by the publisher to say that they'd applied for cultural funds and that they'd been successful. And the author was unaware of this intention prior to being con contacted. So I think this emphasizes the degree to which the selection process and the subsequent success of the translation seem to the author to be very much out of their hands and how it was a process very much driven by the institution. I'll go on to book two. Um, the second book I analyzed in my thesis is an interesting one, I think. The translators in the audience will no doubt recognize this type of story, and it's the most difficult form of supply-driven translation to theorize, I would say, because often what we're talking about here are chance encounters. What I'm interested in are those individual efforts, those motivations, and how they can result in the publication of a book in translation. I define this second type of supply-driven translation as personal supply-driven translation, which I describe as being characterized by an individual's efforts to have a particular work translated. This is often, though not always, the work of a single individual, such as the author of the source text or a translator. Personal supply types often involve the use of personal finances to achieve the translation goal or time for which the translator is only partially or sometimes not at all financially recompensed. So for book two in the study, we have an author who is one of the most widely translated in the selection of novels I analysed. This author has quite a unique approach, certainly amongst those that I interviewed, and I see them very much I see them as very much representative of this personal supply driven approach. And one of the main reasons is this, the author revealed that they don't apply to any of the state funded translation initiatives. They personally finance translations of their work. So they use their own money, they have another job and they find a translator of their own. Um, and then they seek to have this work promoted via an independent literary agent, which from my understanding is, is quite unusual. I haven't come across many people um, who've spoken about sourcing independent agents in, in Slovenia, but perhaps this is changing. Um, in the case of this book though, we see that in actual fact, it's the translator who steps into an agent-like role. And the story of book two goes something like this. Um, an author of a novel, a novel that had been particularly successful in the UK, was in Slovenia on a reading tour. The translator of book two was at this event and happened to speak with the successful author. When the author mentioned that they were about to take a long train journey without anything to read, the translator offered them a copy of their translation of this particular Slovene novel. The author then proceeded to read this translation on their train ride and were so enthused that they raved about the book to their own publisher. Later, that same publisher then went on to publish the Slovene novel in translation. In the Slovene author's words, it was also good luck, but we also see how the author's proactivity in sourcing translations of their work and the translator's apparent organizational skills in having a copy of the translation on them, I'm presuming, um, really worked in their favor and facilitated this particular transaction. There are a couple of authors in the corpus of novels that are really good at illustrating personal supply driven translation. These are particularly proactive individuals, authors, actually both quite different in the way that they've found relative success in translation. To, to say just a few of the general remarks about this type of supply, I'll just draw on some reflections made by interviewees 
who had served on a committee that decides which literary translation projects will receive funding from the Slovene Book Agency. Uh, these interviewees noted that a significant factor in deciding whether or not an author will be published in translation is an individual's ability to navigate the necessary paperwork if they are following a kind of a state funded route that is as as the author I've just talked about shows you can completely avoid those routes entirely but if you do want to apply for um, state funding to support um, translations of your work then your ability to navigate that paperwork is a huge factor in deciding whether or not you will be translated and the more successful you are at this the more funding you're likely to continue receiving because previous successes will then stand in your favour it works like a point points based system um, and tied up in this issue of of kind of factors that influence your ability to be read in translation is the question of competence in the language of the target culture in which you're seeking to be translated. In the Slovene case it was it's really clear from the, the cases that I looked at that a mastery of English or a confidence to present yourself in English to take part in marketing and promotional activities has a significant impact upon just who finds success via a personal supply driven pathway. So the third and final book, and therefore the third and final supply driven pathway that I'm going to talk about is one that I've called academic supply driven translation. But in this example, there are also overlaps with a personal supply driven pathway as well, I think. Before I talk about how book three came to be published, there's something I'd like to flag about this particular type of supply. You'll notice that when talking about institutional supply driven translation, those institutions are based in the source culture. The Slovene Cultural Institute, Slovene Publishing Houses, et cetera, et cetera. With universities though, this is not necessarily the case. These are academic institutions, which from my examples are based in the target culture. And what this raises for me is an important point of differentiation between the idea of supply driven translation and previous iterations of similar concepts, such as source culture driven translation, which was another term um, written about in the Latvian to English context by a scholar called Jeva Zalberger. I do have a, a slide of references at the end. Um, and so with supply driven translation, the focus is not just on the activity that occurs in the source culture, though in the Slovene case, this is crucial to understanding how many of the translations come to exist. But instead, it's on those drives to supply, those actions and motivations that seek to compensate for a lack of demand. The route to publication for book three is a journey of two halves. The first half might sound quite familiar. It involves an author, the author of the novel in question in this case, being abroad and making contact to a cultural event. When both author and contact were back in Slovenia some months later, having now become friends, the author then passes on a novel as a gift. According to the friend who I spoke to about this book's journey into English, the author had passed on this book um, in particular because of its themes. In other words, they'd made an assessment about the book's appeal to the friend and to the potential target audience. On the face of it, it looks like another case of successful networking, but it does get more interesting. The, the friend, the contact, is then so taken by this book, they're so impressed by it, that they resolve to find a translator themselves um, to produce a sample. They personally finance not just one, but three sample translations of the same book and send these uh, to an academic at a university press in the US. The key connection here and something that's important to mention is that the individual who funded the sample translations has also held academic positions and was a member of an academic society for Slovene studies. So that network and that status has to be considered as a factor in the likelihood for this book's eventual publication. The book was published by the University Press, a press which was dependent on the university for subsidies. The editor of the series is an academic working in the field of Slavic literatures who does not receive a salary from the press, 
but instead whose work for the press is, is considered to be a part of his academic role. So we can imagine how such a role influences the type of selections that the editor can make. If his salary does not come from the press and is therefore not reliant on the press making money, then a selection of texts can be governed by other factors, such as, as the editor himself suggests, the amount of prestige that a book or an author might bring to a series. The translator that was eventually chosen on the basis of their sample translation was also an academic at a US university. The translation was funded in small part by the academic press and in part by a wealthy donor, a Soviet national based in the US, who is credited on the inside of the translation cover. So this case of academic supply driven translation flags up a couple of things for me. That this type of supply could be particularly associated with types of literature considered to be classics. Titles that are renowned in certain cultural contexts, which would bring a degree of cultural capital to a university press or to an academic um, who also happens to be an editor or a translator also working in academia. Um, so to contrast with institutional supply, which, as I mentioned earlier, might have a tendency, might favour living contemporary authors um, in order to serve um, those institutions' interests at a given time, an academic supply pathway could favour books published many years ago, perhaps considered to be classics or canonical, no matter how problematic um, those terms might be. And if I reflect on my own experience as a translator here, I can also see elements of academic supply-driven translation in the projects that I've been involved in too. Um, as well as some, some elements of institutional supply as well. I would not have been able to take on the first novel I translated were it not for the fact that I was receiving PhD funding. That income from an academic position was key in me being able to take that leap and take on that translation work. And indeed, the very fact that I came to learn Slovene via an academic trajectory has been a privilege that has afforded me the time to learn such a skill and carry out such translation work. If I'd been reliant on Slovene to English translation work as a sole source of income, it's unlikely that I would have been able to take the plunge as a freelancer, particularly not when starting out. So my position within an academic institution has been a crucial factor in me being able to undertake those literary translations. So I've offered you three examples here, each of which illustrates what I see as a defining characteristic of the type of translation journey one that is motivated by a wish to supply a translation of a particular work but carried out by different means. And what these pathways can show us is that a less translated literature, like Slovene literature, is available in translation thanks to a varied range of practices primarily initiated in the source culture. Literary translations from uh, less translated languages, from a less translated language into a so-called major language are not just sporadic occurrences determined by conditions in the target culture, which means that terms often used to describe languages and literatures such as Slovene, like small or peripheral, there's a range of terms like this. These aren't to be equated with passivity and nor does an asymmetrical relationship between source culture and target culture denote an absence of agency in determining which literary texts become available in translation. I haven't gone into lots of detail about the broader historical context in which supply-driven translation practices have developed in Slovenia, but I will say that even though I focused on a relatively contemporary period, I don't consider supply-driven translation processes to be anything new. For example, archival documents from the 60s and 70s onwards show Slovene authors to be amongst some of the most proactive Yugoslav writers, organizing literary appearances and readings abroad, inviting other authors to Slovenia, seeking potential opportunities for translation. We therefore see that outwardly seeking recognition as a nation synonymous with literature has long been the work of agents within the Slovene literary field, even before such a field could be defined in sovereign national terms. I'm aware that I've covered a lot of ground today and 
these are big questions and topics, but I hope that you found something interesting in, in what I've said. And I hope that this one very small piece of the jigsaw puzzle can encourage us to be more flexible in the ways that we write about, think about literary translation in the Anglophone context and might help us to challenge some of those assumptions about how translations come to exist in English and the impact this has upon the stories we're able to read. Thank you for listening. Super, thank you so much, Olivia. We You're have, uh, we have uh, a good uh, half hour plus four questions. So can I invite you at this point to use the uh, Q&A? Uh, I can see one question has come in already, splendid. Um, please do use the Q&A function to pose your questions or to make uh, any comments for uh, Olivia. And um, it is set up so that you can also, um, you can also approve of previous questions and they will be um, up, they can be upvoted up the list uh, so that they're given priority over other questions. So do please, um, do please let us know your responses in the Q&A. And while people are thinking about their questions, perhaps I can kick off Olivia um, with some questions from me. Um, I, I, that was a lovely presentation. Thank you so much. I, I think I know, uh, unfortunately, very little about the, the Slovenian scene. Most of what I know about uh, these matters is through contact with your work. And so I'm, I'm wondering, um, you're focusing on Slovenian, uh, on Slovene English translation here. Um, I, my, I'm interested in how typical each of those polls is. So how typical uh, the English side is, and we can perhaps come on to that, but how typical the Slovene side is as well. Would you say that among less translated languages that Slovene is typical there? I, I'm wondering, for example, you gave us a historical introduction earlier on and you uh, uh, point out that uh, Slovenia uh, achieved independence most recently only in 1991. And I'm wondering, therefore, whether actually uh, Slovene, the Slovene language uh, literature has perhaps a, a tougher job uh, getting recognition um, because of the relatively uh, recent independence of the country and the relatively recent then um, founding of the kinds of um, support, institutional support um, uh, apparatus that you were talking about in your talk, or whether that's in itself typical of a less translated language? That's a really good question, and, and I think I see quite a few questions in there. Like in, in response to your first point, in terms of talking about how typical those two contexts are, I think that's really impossible to answer, actually. Not, not least because, obviously, I spend so much time immersed researching one cultural context that you can, you can lose perspective. I, I can look at a list of titles published in, in Slovene and I can say, wow, there were, there were 33 published in this 25 year period. That's amazing. And then somebody with no knowledge of, of that context, but like, that's not very many books. You really lose a grip on, you know, on, on what is relative because it depends from where you're standing, doesn't it? Um, you, did you ask whether it was perhaps harder because of the transition from socialism to capitalism? Um, I think, I, I mean, again, to compare, I, I'm not sure what I would be comparing to. I would say that there, is a, there, are, there are narratives in Slovenia about the role of literature and language in Slovenia's national development in the kind of development of a national consciousness, which are very widely cited. They're well known in public discourses and they're very much seen as, um, and they're also quoted like in, in my research when I was talking to agents about why they felt supporting translation was important and asking them about how they saw their work. You know, references would come, come up talking about kind of important national figures in the development of Slovene language and literature. So it's, it's very much a presence, but 
I would say that this probably mirrors um, many other cases of, of European nations whose kind of historical trajectories to, to recognition as a sovereign nation state might have some similarities. Mm. Um, there were definitely very specific challenges in this transition period, not least the shifting role of the writer, changing um, amounts of su state support for authors to carry out their work, and also a shift in, I suppose, like the perceived symbolic value of the writer and of literature. Um, I, one of the challenges that authors talk about is how all of a sudden after independence, um, because everything suddenly had to be market driven and those conditions then favor literature that is more commercially viable. So the variety of literature perhaps um, changed. But I wouldn't say that in general, talking about translation from Slovene into English, that Slovenia necessarily has it any harder than other less translated languages. I can't speak on behalf of those, but um, I think it's the kind of, it's the predominance of English that is the problem, rather than anything that these less translated languages and those source cultures are doing. Right, so there's always, there's, that asymmetry as you referred to it in so many of these uh of these relationships then um perhaps we can we can switch then to the other the other poll if you like and to the question of english because english is in so many ways atypical isn't it and i i'm just wondering um I perhaps take a, a first question here from patrick who's wondering similarly about the situation in other European countries. Patrick says, thank you, Olivia. You spoke somewhat of the Anglo-centric view of some translations and their prevalence. Um, are Germany, uh, are German and Germany and France, for example, more likely to look for foreign language books to translate? It's a, it's a really good question. Again, I've been so focused on the dynamics between two very particular um, cultural contexts. I'm not sure whether we could say that. I'd be really interested to know, and maybe, I don't know, are there any translators uh, from French or German here that might be able to offer us some insight? Um, I mean, it is obviously widely cited that there is a particularly low proportion of, um, a particularly low proportion of literature published in English is in translation. Um, so I think that is a particular, that, that is perhaps the main hurdle or one of the main hurdles but yeah it would be really interesting to know comparatively like how perhaps how agents in those small nation contexts such as Slovenia or less translated languages um linguistic contexts how they perceive the challenges that they feel they face into different um, so-called major languages. That would be something I think would be really interesting to look at. Because there's, <clears throat> there's such a pressure, isn't there, to be translated uh, into English for access to a, a more global market very often. Um, and um, there's, uh, as you say, the the relative lack of, uh, of published translations in the English-speaking world suggests that there's going to be, relatively speaking, less um, uh, demand-led uh, translation as a as a consequence, um, and on the other hand, then there's there's uh, such a desire, competing desires among different less translated uh, language cultures to be represented in English. But yes, I mean English is not the only uh, world language, and please do um, uh, do uh, contribute if you have uh, experience from France. Uh, Germany or uh, anywhere else. I know our uh, audience is really very multinational. Um, can we perhaps move on then to Isabella's uh, question? So Isabella Torizan uh, asks, says, thank you so much for this interesting presentation. I apologize if this is too basic a question, but I'm curious about how a language is defined as less translated. So that's a key, a key term in your, in your title and in your work more generally. Is it by comparing the numbers of publications then? Is it uh, a straightforward 
a quantitative measure like that? Um, it, no, it's a really good question and, and thank you, Isabella. I probably should have flagged that at, at the start. Um, I use that term, which is has been kind of coined by um, a researcher who works on Catalan literature, um, Branch Adele, there is a publication, an edit edited volume called Less Translated Languages. Um, and I should have I should have written down his exact wording, but it's it, he defines less translated languages as languages which are uh, typically less less often the source of of translation in the international exchange of linguistic goods. It goes something like that. Um, and I think the reason that I tend to favor this this phrase is because I think that phrase sort of highlights the way in which languages are less translated because of the, the dominance of the Anglophone publishing market when we're looking at translations into English. Um, and I like that the definition doesn't attempt to attribute any property to the language itself. There's some terms such as the kind of the major and the minor. I think that there's a bit of a value implication there. Um, and of course, that there's problems with all kinds of terminology and, and things have their pros and their cons depending on the context in which you use them. But I feel that at the moment, less translated is most obviously a statement of fact. However, um, this could cover such a huge number of languages when we're looking at um, language literatures translated into English that it is very possibly too broad. It could, it could conceal all kinds of inequalities of oppression. And, you know, I'm, I'm very aware that I translate from one small translated language of a central European country, predominantly white. And so a less translated language to me is, is one thing, but to, to another translator, it could be something entirely different. So um, yeah, definitely thinking a lot about terminology at the moment and how we can talk about these kind of very specific contexts in, in a broader way. Maybe we never can. I'm, I'm really open to hearing what other people think about that. And, and I've really enjoyed some of the recent conversations around it, so. Thanks, Olivia. Um, perhaps we can move on then. Uh, thank you for the, the uh, questions which have been coming in. Um, can we take uh, William Blacker's question next? Uh, William says, thank you for an interesting talk. I recognized what you were saying about the role of academics in translation, speaking as one of them. I wonder whether this, however, comes with the risk of uh, sorry, it's just uh, momentarily moved off the screen. The risk of confining these translations to academia, to university presses, libraries, and so beyond the reach of a wider public, and also whether it potentially shapes the translations in a certain way to be more explanatory, for example, with academic forewords, footnotes, and so on. So a question specifically about your, uh, your third category of, uh, of supply-driven translation, uh, the academic. Yeah, um, I'm glad that it that it resonated that, that somebody recognised that. Um, that's encouraging, um, and yeah, I I completely agree with your observations. I think it can affect uh, the text in that way. I think the way that I see this supply driven translation framework is a way of just kind of looking back and framing things, and that, and as a means of potentially flagging up things that we might not otherwise notice. So. Yeah, there are definitely things that could be added to the definition and the way that I talk about it. And I think it's certainly true, kind of at least from anecdotal experience and looking at the corpus that those books that are published with university presses on the ones that have received um, kind of reviews in, in more accessible review outlets, particularly in, in the UK. Um, and, and perhaps they do have a more a more kind of niche intended audience. Um, but it it can also it could be a two-way process. That could also be because 
that type of supply tends to favor literature that is not necessarily as commercially viable like if you if you aren't um dependent on making money from the publication of a translation then then you potentially have a bit more freedom um in in what you can publish um, and that might not have the same widespread commercial appeal so i can i can look at that in both directions i think and it, it depends very much on the uh, on the genre as well, doesn't it? I'm just thinking of uh, my uh, field in which I'm particularly interested myself in the translation of philosophy. I mean, so much of that is done by uh, by academic translators. Um, thinking about genres, um, a question from Isabel Stainsby. I noticed at the beginning that you specifically talked about literary fiction. As one of the most successful writers in translation in recent years is Andrzej Sapkowski, who wrote the Witcher series, maybe those of us who translate from less translated languages should be looking at translating genre fiction also. But would this be more difficult in terms of funding, etc.? And then in parentheses, I declare an interest. I translate science fiction into English. Also, as a Slovak to English translator, I totally believe the number of people who confuse the two languages. So genre fiction. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's something that I think is is definitely absent from the corpus of novels that I looked at. Um, I do think that the, there is a place for it. And, and yeah, definitely if as translators, we recognize that then perhaps translators are, are the people to start advocating for that. Um, it opens up a lot of bigger questions, doesn't it? About the reasons why translations are supplied. Um, and this is a really interesting thing when you look at translations as a form of supply rather than a demand, perhaps some of the best sellers that we see in English, like translated fiction in English, maybe they do have more of a genre fiction element, particularly when we think about some of the crime suspenseful thrillers that have found success amongst um, an Anglophone readership audience. Um, but I'm just trying to think about the kind of books that have been put forward Unless, unless there would there was an author who was particularly proactive in navigating these um, funding structures, I, I'm not sure that it would be, given the current setup, something that would be put forward at an institutional level, because sometimes I think there is an element of wanting to represent um, Slovene literature in a certain way, perhaps, as Slovenia, as the kind of the importance of Slovene literature is constructed. It's as much like the, the drive to supply is as much about the, the cultural capital that that brings to the source author and to that source institution as much as it is about um, what happens in, in the target cultural context. So I think there would be you know, we kind of would need to unpick the, the way that symbolic value is attributed to literature in the source um, culture context to really understand why genre fiction is perhaps not put forward in the same way. But I, I would absolutely be, be more for um, trying to find more different genres um, to publish in translation, definitely. I think that really came out in your presentation, the way in which because of these different pathways, if you like, they favor certain kinds of literature, each of them, so that the academic uh, route favors more the classic literature that one might want to study in universities, whereas um, institutional uh, sponsors are likely to want to promote contemporary literature. And so there are whole swathes of the literary landscape that, that perhaps fall through the cracks, genre fiction um, being, being one kind. Um, Absolutely, and it's it's only through looking back at what has happened and how the books that have arrived in English translation, how they got there in the first place, that we are able to identify where those where those crack, cracks and those gaps are. Like if we were to ignore the vast swathe of activity and the time and the initiative invested by those source culture agents, we would be none the wiser as to why those gaps occur. So. so maybe that's where the onus is on the individuals to promote particular examples of say genre fiction or other other kinds of literature that hasn't yet 
uh, being being transferred in the same in the same way, um, and uh, uh, and open up uh, markets in a small way uh, individually. Mm -hmm. um, Julia Sherwood, uh, also thinking of uh, the the Slovak uh, parallel case, uh, Julia. Uh, has a question. Firstly, she says, thanks for a great talk. The pattern is very similar in the case of Slovak literature, more grounds for confusion. And I'd say that most translations are also supply driven. I wonder how common it is in your experience that in the second scenario, the personal initiative comes from the author. In my experience, it's more often the translator who champions a particular author and looks for a publisher sometimes for several years. Interesting. Uh, thank you for your question, Julia. I'm, I'm glad that we've had another opportunity to talk about parallels that we that we have experienced um, as translators of small European languages. Um, I think in in my experience, in the cases that I have come across, it is more popular. Um, it, it's fair, it's quite common. This is hard to quantify without being able to recall exactly how many books um, resulted in a translation in this way, but. I would say that Slovene authors on the whole are quite proactive. And this is this is in part due to quite a well established literary infrastructure. There is the Writers Union, um, which has, you know, I think it's in the like 300 members. Um, there's quite a lot of events which are focused on encouraging authors to promote themselves abroad. I think there is on the whole a desire to do this. Um, from the interviews that I did, I could detect a pattern of this desire to be read. And I think that it's, it's inherently tied up in this perception of smallness and in narratives of smallness within Slovenia, like very small country, and so immediately as a writer, you are faced with quite a small potential readership. And so that desire to be read is not just about wanting to be available in English translation. It's just about wanting to reach a wider audience for a lot of people. So I do think that there is a um, definite pattern of proactivity on the part of authors. Um, there are definitely a couple of translators who are quite proactive, but I would also say that because of some of the institutional initiatives, a lot of the translators that work from Slovene, including myself, are often in positions where work comes to them, that, that work is agreed and contracted and funds are applied for before the translator knows about it. So I think a combination of proactive authors and a desire to be read beyond a kind of a small national border and also a proactivity of institutions who are providing a supply of potential translation work to translators means that yeah perhaps the translators are less proactive at the moment. I hope that answers your question. We have uh, some, uh, perhaps you could take some shorter uh, comments and questions uh, now. So Anne uh, Thompson Ahmadova says, thank you, that was very interesting. I think your analysis applies to translations from Azerbaijani uh, too. Uh, so another, another parallel case. Um, I'd love to chat some more about that sometime. So do, do please uh, get in touch with uh, Olivia, Anne. Um, and uh, on the question you mentioned then, the proactivity on the part of Slovene, um, uh, Slovenian institutions and a couple of uh, related questions. Anna Bentley asking, you mentioned EU funding, but what Slovenian state funding is available? And Chris Mosley as well, thanks for a fascinating talk. Has a national Slovenian literary agency existed since independence or even before then? And how has it developed its international contacts? attending book fairs, running summer schools for translators, other ways of linking translators to authors. Um, so questions of institutional promotion then within Slovenia. Yes, um, so the Slovenian Book Agency um, was founded post-independence. Um, but th there has been a network of more informal organizations that existed 
prior to that. Um, and in my research, I noted a bit of tension really between some of the earlier smaller um, organizations that had existed and that had worked quite independently to facilitate exchanges between writers to encourage translations, even producing um, sample booklets of, of, of Slovene writers. Um, there's a tension between the smaller organizations when the main government funded book agency was established that kind of created um, those smaller institutions weren't happy about there being one central organization that wanted to take control of a job that they had already been doing for years. Um, but I would say that the, the network in, in Slovenia is quite sophisticated really and and maybe if I also say something about my experience of learning Slovene that might help to sort of paint a picture of the overall institutional infrastructure. So I, my impetus to learn Slovene was, was definitely, it came from studying at Nottingham. One of my Russian translation professors um, suggested that um, if I wanted to be a translator, it might be worth um, branching out and, and learning another Slavonic language. And so I applied for graduate jobs and I applied for funding to learn Slovene because at the time you could do a postgraduate diploma in a language, which was just one intensive year of language training. So that initiated there and that was the start of it. But once I was on that path, this whole kind of network of opportunity was opened up to me and the, the links between the University of Ljubljana and Nottingham University that existed at the time was hugely inf influential in me continuing. I was able to attend uh, within the four months of learning Slovene, I was going to a winter school in Ljubljana. Um, I have been regularly to the seminar Slovene Language, Literature and Culture, which is organized by the Centre for Slovene as a second foreign language at the University of Ljubljana. Slovene learners from all over the world congregate every summer in Ljubljana and take part in two weeks worth of classes, lectures, excursions. It's, it's an amazing operation that brings together so many people from around the world, all with this purpose of promoting the learning of Slovene. And so that tells you something about, about the investment and, and also the state funded investment that's there for not only the learning of Slovene, but the kind of wider promotion of Slovene language and literature. Um, perhaps we can, we can move on um, to, again, a couple of related questions. Um, Firstly, um, from uh, Pavel Bliznyuk, uh, how did demands for translation from Slovenian change over the years and what has been more in demand? Translations of well-known authors to major languages or translation into less, uh, translation into uh, less translated languages? So has there been a change over the years in your experience? Um, and uh, similarly from Owen. Owen says, thank you for this presentation. Do you see any trends in what sorts of novels from Slovenia were selected during this period? And do you see trends changing now? Thank you for both of those questions. Um, with the first one, I, th I think it's, it's worth noting that um, English isn't the, the language that Slovene is most translated into. Most I went to a presentation by the Slovenian Book Agency in December, and we were told then that the German is the most frequent language that Slovene literature is translated into, with over 300 translations. Is that to date or is that per year? Sorry, I'll need to check that. Um, then in second place is Croatian, then Italian, and then English. So English is fourth in the list. Um, in terms of thinking about demand, um, I can certainly say that in terms of the amount of translations published, I think there was a peak around 2009, 2010. And at the minute there is a slight decline in terms of the number of translations published from Slovene overall. Um, but obviously anecdotally, I've only translated three books and I haven't been doing this for so long really. So it's quite hard for me to think about how, how the demand has changed and um, I never see it as a constant. And I think that's quite an important point that other translators of, of less translated languages might recognize that it's not 
something that you can take for granted and and work can be quite sporadic in that way so I hope that answers that question in part I'm not sure it does fully but um I'll try and answer the trends question. Um, the main thing that I would say is that if you were to look at corpus of novels published during the post-independence period of a country, an, a reasonable assumption might be that some of the themes covered in those books published in that period might reflect that period of transition. Um, and I was always fascinated by the fact that this wasn't the case. Um, there's some really interesting work. Um, I think that some of, there is some work by Alozia Zupan Sausage in English. Most of it's in Slovene, and I really should translate some, but, but she says some really interesting things about um, patterns in the literature published in Slovene after independence and how rather than kind of authors addressing that very kind of tectonic shift, everything sort of retreats inwards and it's the, the kind of the predominant themes in that literature are quite quiet and internal, which I think is really interesting. And, and maybe also it's, it was just too soon, like we're talking about like potentially very raw trauma. So maybe it's understandable that such topics weren't broached in literature for quite some time. In terms of what was published into Engl in English translation, thematically, again, um, you don't see much of, of Yugoslavia. There are there are a couple of works that touch upon this topic. Um, Goran Vojnovic, notably being one of those authors, Mikha Mazzini being another. Um, but it's, it's quite an interesting selection in terms of themes. Um, because of the varied ways that it has come to exist. Um, maybe when we think about patterns in sort of in publishing and trends, is, is that connected to demand driven processes? Do can we talk about patterns and trends in the same way? If, if books are a result of a supply, and that supply is driven by a number of factors, maybe the patterns are never going to be the same. This is something that I, I would really like to think about more. I'm not sure I do know the answer to that question, but overall, I would say that there isn't, there isn't a consistent theme. The Second World War actually is, is perhaps one of the more um, prominent motifs and, and thematic um, concepts in, in the literature published in translation which is not only popular in, in Slovene fiction, but perhaps it also resonates more because it's considered to be a European topic. And so if authors and translators are, are pitching to publishers in the target culture, that is a topic that they find resonates and that they're able to draw links to. Olivia, um, it, it feels as though we're um, taxing your voice a, a, a little uh, with all these questions. So perhaps I can just read out some of the comments uh, uh, in the next uh, next um, minute or so. Ekaterina Krasnova says, thank you, Olivia. Really interesting. Siggy Frank says, thank you for a great paper, Olivia. Really Aww. interesting, really interesting research. Um, there's a uh, another parallel is being proposed uh, by uh, Murin Maguire. Uh, thank you for an excellent and very clear talk, Olivia. Really helpful for my research on Estonia. I already see a number of analogous dynamics in place. So again, do please get in touch with Olivia uh, separately if you have uh, parallel cases like that. I wonder then if I can um, uh, again put a, a couple of paired um, or what seem to me to be paired questions. Um, Firstly, from, from Roy Udale. Thanks, Olivia. This was great. Can I ask what proportion of the 32 novels that you mentioned was accounted for by each of your three types of translation pathway? Uh, that's probably, that's probably a, a, it's a big question, I'm sure. It's probably not going to be possible to account for all 32, but um, 
could you perhaps give a, a sort of ballpark sense of the the different uh, proportions of, that are represented by those three pathways? And can I also tag on um, a question from Melita Kolechny, who says, thanks, Olivia, very insightful and interesting. You mentioned three major channels. Were there any other channels, additional channels that you noticed in your research that somehow couldn't be classified into the three major categories. And she was also, she said, surprised at the limited number of titles having been published over 15 years, particularly as you've mentioned that um, into German, there are many more uh, uh, translations compared to English. So a question about your three types of uh, translation pathway, relative uh, balance, between them and whether there are other uh, translations that perhaps in your research you found uncategorizable? Uh, thank you for both of those questions. Um, firstly, to Roy, that, that is quite a difficult question. And I have to say that's something that I'm actually working on at the minute as I'm writing up um, my thesis as a book. Um, trying to tie up some some loose ends that I wasn't able to cover within the scope of my thesis and and there are still a couple of unsolved cases which means I don't have the exact number of of how many um can be attributed to each type of supply um something that I can tell you which I hope is some kind of offering um is that if you look at the more contemporary end of the corpus it, there is definitely an increase in institutional supply driven translations and this can be directly attributed to the success or oh, the kind of ongoing um partnership between um a publisher in 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 Slovenia and in the UK so this partner um this bilateral partnership has an established relationship which is now seems to be regularly producing translations um that's how my translations, uh, two of my translations from Slovene into English have come to exist. Um, and so that is having a significant impact on, on numbers, I would say. Um, and to Melita's question, I haven't found any other channels, Melita, to be honest, that, that could be classified as separate channels on their own. I think that the three tend to rather the three or combinations of the three tend to cover the dynamics that I've observed. So they might, one translation journey might not always be purely institutional or purely academic, but some, there are overlaps between the types as, as the kind of, as the third case um, demonstrated. So I haven't found the need to suggest others, but that's not to say that that might not change. Um, there have been quite a few. So my corpus ended in 2016 um, because I had to stop somewhere whilst I was writing my thesis and 25 year period seemed like quite a neat time frame. Um, but I do think it would be really interesting now to look at the years since, like an extra five year period. And, and I think that things could look a little bit different. So um, if I find something new out, I will, I will be sure to let you know. You mentioned then uh, the years, um, more recent years. There's a, a contribution in the uh, the Q and A from Metka Zupancic, uh, a reference to an article on Slovene literature in translation from 1919 to 2006, which cites over 250 titles into French, over 400 titles into German. So that's very much the long view um, wow. historically. Um, thank you for the, those who have been uh, sending in further questions. We don't have too much time left, so I'm sure uh, we won't be able to exhaust all of your questions, uh, but let's see if we can uh, tackle a few more. Uh, Medka uh, began her contribution to the Q&A strand by saying, hello, fascinating talk. I think we have so much in common, if I may. In 2012, we conducted research in the same field. Um, and then Metka goes on to ask, have you looked into the earlier appearance of Slovene literature in the UK and the USA? And have you thought of expanding your research to cover possible translations in Australia or even New Zealand or any other predominantly English speaking countries? So what about um, translations, publication of 
these English translations outside of the UK and the USA? Um, I would definitely like to expand, um, yeah, into other um, target publishing contexts. The reason I didn't um, was just to try and find some boundaries within the scope of my thesis. I think from memory, I can remember that there are a couple more titles uh, of Slovene novels translated into English after 91, but published in Australia. I think Micha Mazzini has at least one title published by an Australian publishing house. Um, and he has uh, translations published in the UK, the US and Australia, um, which I think is testament to this particular author's proactivity in um, getting himself out there and, and kind of making that process work for himself. Um, in terms of earlier appearances, I didn't study that, but I often came across things, uh, particularly when looking in the archives of the Slovenian Penland Writers Association. There are lots of earlier references to and um, the kind of setting up of translations basically is absolutely fascinating to read that um that kind of that process of negotiation and, and correspondence and 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 I think I would I would definitely love to to trace some more of those more of that correspondence to see if it resulted in in actual publications um sometimes it, it does result in publication of excerpts in in journal articles and things like that or in literary magazines that's quite that was quite prominent in the archives I found um but in the archives I don't think I found reference to actual books um they they must exist um but that's definitely something I'd like to, to look back and, and find out more on. So some more, thank you, Olivia, some more comparative perspectives. Uh, so Metka continued with a, a parallel with France, or at least the contrast with France. In France, Slovene, uh, Slovene language had a similar treatment as in English, but once an author is being recognized, they can continue to be translated as with uh, Drago Jancha, for example. Um, so that's a, a, a uh, a point from the French case. Uh, and uh, Lydia Pompa also uh, contributed a, a perspective from the Netherlands. I was listening. Uh, thank you, Lydia. I was listening at, at the same time talking about the situation here in Holland. Quite interesting. Anyway, anyhow, here there are only a few Slovene authors whose books have been translated into Dutch. Most of the books were from Drago Jancha. Anyhow, it's quite difficult to present those authors to the readers here because there's quite a lot of competition with other languages. So would you say it's the same in English then? Uh, is there enough of a, of a market for Slovenian translated literature um, in English for certain authors to have emerged and to have acquired a readership uh, uh, compared with uh, the, the rest, if you like? That's that's really hard. I feel like that's kind of that requires us to offer our own judgment, I suppose, on on what is what is worthy of visibility or not. And mm. I I guess I don't really see it in that way. Like I I think what this what this kind of study and what the supply driven framework shows is that books will always be translated. And books can be translated and published not because they are like, the best book ever but because of a wide range of factors and some people will like that book and some people won't and perhaps it's that um that kind of assumption that things have to be successful in order to be translated i mean it's, it's capitalism right but that is, is kind of part of part of the problem maybe and I'm not sure whether that answers the question, but um, perhaps it's more like the, the framing of that idea that is the issue. I, I absolutely think there is space for for authors to find a readership, and and as long as that funding can be found um, to to financially recompense everybody involved, then then there is space. You know, obviously, finding the the funding is often a huge hurdle, but. I wonder we could, uh, if we could take perhaps just a, a, a couple more uh, questions because we're approaching uh, 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 half past here. Um, 
I, there's a, a question from much earlier on, which I've been kind of saving up uh, from MCV. Uh, what about the effect of demand-led initiatives from English language publishers? For instance, Istros Books in London have published a number of Slovene novels in translation, and to some extent will proactively look for others. And of course, there are other examples. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting that you see that as demand, as demand driven. Um, actually, when I talk about bilateral publishing partnerships, what the example I have in mind is Istros. And there, there is, of course, an element of target culture agency in that, in that negotiation, in that partnership, because they have the ultimate say in whether or not they decide to publish a book. But what my research has shown is that all of the, in the Slovene to English case, so much of the groundwork and the selecting and the sourcing of funding comes from the Slovene side. So it's kind of essentially bringing a package of ready to go books to the UK publisher and of, and of course there are there are exceptions and and yeah I know with other languages in particular perhaps where that setup doesn't exist that Eastras are really proactive um, and particularly in the languages with which that editor and publisher is more familiar as well um, they, they, they there is maybe a more demand driven element to it but I think certainly in the partnership that has existed with Slovene literature I definitely see that as a form of supply. Uh, a, a, another parallel being proposed by Matilda, uh, a, the Catalan case, uh, and uh, she asked, I wonder if there can be a shift over time from a supply driven to a semi demand driven system. I'm thinking of the Catalan case where until uh, the early to mid 2000s supply driven accounted for most translations. And while this still does happen, I think there is beginning to be a slow shift towards more demand driven approaches. That's uh, Matilda suggesting that there's a shift occurring in the, the Catalan case. Interesting. Uh, so uh, please, can I invite you, uh, uh, particularly if you haven't uh, uh, had your uh, question um, raised, if you have other questions, do please uh, get in touch with Olivia after the session. Um, I think it's been uh, wonderful to see the um, the number of re responses that your that your presentation, Olivia, has raised because it's such an, an urgent question uh, for those who have Slovenian literature very much at heart and for those who are considering these questions from a really wide variety of other perspectives as well. Um, I wonder if we can take then one final question. Uh, uh, this is from Thomas MacDonald, and again, it was uh, an early question, but uh, I've been saving this one up because I think it's uh, very appropriate uh, for a last question. And Thomas says, thank you for this excellent talk. What would you recommend to translators of Slovene, particularly those who are just getting started? So that's a, it's a very general question, but what would you recommend to translators of Slovene, particularly those who are just getting started? It's a, yeah, it's a really good question. Um, Firstly, I would say familiarize yourself with the, the support available in um, the kind of the, the language learning sense. There are so many programs that the language seminar, um, the seminar of Slovene language literature and culture and language schools. There is a specific translation seminar run by the Slovenian book agency. If you're kind of au fait um, with these organizations and you know when events are happening, that there is so much um, effort and time invested in, in supporting um, language learners and by extension translators in kind of pursuing that interest. So if you're starting out, I would definitely make the most of the support that's available to keep, to keep your language learning up, to keep your contact with, um, with institutions in Slovenia up. Um, Another thing that I probably should say is maybe don't have too many big expectations about the amount of work that you might get. I very much kind of see it as a, a project, um, a creative project. Be realistic about um, what you could be expected to earn from such a pursuit. Um, 
and I say that not to be discouraging that it's something I have to tell myself all the time like if I could just translate Slovene books that would be what I would choose to do with my time but I can't like, I I can only afford to do this because of my my academic career which is in itself not always stable but it's the kind of the, the balance that I've managed to find so maybe have an equivalent balance of your own so that you're not solely relying on income from translation, particularly literary translation. Um, and the other thing I would say is read a lot and through those connections with translation seminars, language seminars, language schools, ask the people that you meet through those what they have enjoyed reading in Slovene. Always ask for reading recommendations and try to kind of broaden those reading horizons as much as you can because this is something that I'm trying to do now you kind of can find that certain books fall into your lap um because people are keen to give them to you or you come across them from these kind of very particular channels but there's so much out there and it does take a bit of time to really find what you enjoy and what you think is important so invest a bit of time in kind of um in reading around and finding something that really sparks you. Lovely. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you, everybody who uh, uh, raised questions. We've had uh, a, a wonderful discussion. It's been over three quarters of an hour, so we need to draw things to a close. Let me just um, mention uh, the, rem the remaining research seminars that we have uh, coming up this term in a couple of weeks. Our next research seminar on the 17th of February will be given by David Kawashima, uh, who will be joining us from Tokyo to discuss his recent book, Who We're Reading When We're Reading Murakami. Uh, then in March, we'll be hearing from Swiss colleague Martin Enard Duteil. And in April, our uh, UEA Leverhulme Early Career Fellow, Sophie Stevens. So details of all these will be on our website uh, and on Eventbrite shortly. So uh, those are the events coming up, but for now then, uh, it's time to wrap up. And can I conclude by thanking once again, Olivia for a fantastic presentation, for being so generous with your time uh, in the question session. Thank you everybody again then for attending and uh, hope to see you again. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Duncan. <laughs>